Looking forward to another season of adventure through the national parks, another season of trivia and drag queens and games along the way? Then be sure to join us, your hosts, Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan of Gaze at the National Parks when our seventh season launches on September 23rd, 2024. And if you can't wait till then, maybe revisit some of your favorite parks, trails, and trail mix episodes in the meantime with our episode finder. Click the link in our show notes, our Instagram bio, or visit our website to make navigating our library of episodes as simple as a few clicks. Happy trails and see you again September 23rd. This episode of Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast is sponsored by Moon Travel Guides. Moon Travel is the travel guidebook publisher for ethical travel. Don't spend months trying to build the perfect trip when you can do it all with Moon. Whether you are taking a short trip, exploring a European city, heading to a national park, or traveling to South America, Asia, or beyond, make sure to pack a Moon Travel Guide with you. Hello, and welcome to Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. I'm Dusty. And I'm Mike. While our long format episodes explore one hiking trail in one national park, one park at a time, Trail Mix is the short format episode of our show. It's where we get to explore topics we didn't get to cover in our long format episodes, including history, science, environmental justice, and also interviews. Today's Trail Mix is a very special interview with Miles Howard, author of The Moon, New England Road Trip, and co-author of Moon, New England Hiking with Kelsey Parrott. As a New England native, Miles has spent a lot of time exploring the landscape and cities of the Northeast, from trails to breweries to local haunts and everything in between. An adventurer at heart, Miles' travels through New England, spanning from his youth till now, have made him a connoisseur of the region, but one with a healthy appetite to continue to discover something new and thrilling. Whether it's the history-laden streets of Boston, the islands of mid-coast Maine, or the far reaches of northern Vermont, New England offers a healthy variety of charm, history, and adventure. Along with his writings from Moon travel, Miles has also written for Boston Magazine, the Boston Globe, Southwest Airlines, the magazine, and many more. As Mike and I have hiked and visited all over New England, we were beyond thrilled to have the opportunity to sit down and chat with Miles about Moon New England Road Trip and all of the treasures that this region of the country has to offer. Miles, welcome to the show. We're so excited to chat with you. We've been peeling through the Moon Travel Guide New England Road Trip, which we loved going through because we live in New Jersey and we've been to so many of these places that you talk about in the book. We're just so excited to chat with you about all of it today. Awesome. Well, it's great to be here with you both. Uh, You know, even as someone who's lived in New England for the majority of my life, um, I feel like I never quite had the synthesis of experiencing so much of the region in a road trip until I wrote this book, strangely enough. You you know, it, it is such a small area where one would assume that, you know, any resident would have kind of an intimacy with all these regions. But, you know, we develop our habitual territories, our favorites. And this was uh, a wonderful way to absorb the entire state in one prolonged gulp. So or the, the entire region, I should say. And it covers a lot. It yeah. covers a lot. Like, um, it's not just like really great hikes in like great places and gorgeous places. It's like also really great things to do, awesome places to eat. Shout out to the fact that you included Canteen from Provincetown in here, because I feel like um, it is sometimes so overlooked. And I'm like, y'all, it's the it's the best place to eat because it's one. The food is great. And two, the like it's um, uh, it's so easy. And oftentimes those restaurants in Provincetown can be like long waits. um, But. Uh, no, I love that you included that. You know, I was really hoping of all the great places to eat in P-Town, you might highlight the canteen because it, you know, it, it's amazing for all the reasons you pointed out. And somehow it still manages to feel like this little hub of the universe right there that people haven't discovered and descended upon quite yet. And I don't know how that's possible after all these years, but I try to go there at least once every time I'm in the region. Absolutely. They also have such great frosé and... Um, that is like, you know, yet. the beverage that I have every time I go there. It's delicious, uh, but it's also, you know, a few of them will, will you know, <laughs> send you into outer space. Mm-hmm. 
Well, the window's closing for it now. I'm gonna, I, I may get down there once before we get into the depths of fall right here. But, you know, that's one thing that has been nice about, you know, doing all of this uh, research for the book is, uh, you know, realizing how much of the New England ecosphere, including the edible side, I've yet to personally experience quite yet after uh, almost 30 years of being rooted here. So, uh, yeah, I will have to uh, investigate that next time I'm in the vicinity. So you mentioned going down to, to P-Town. Where are you based out of? So I live in a neighborhood of Boston called Jamaica Plain, which is kind of on the southern end of the city. It's where a lot of the big and palatial parks that Frederick Law Olmsted designed are located, like uh, Franklin Park and Arnold Arboretum. And uh, I've been here for about 12 years. I've lived in the Boston area since I was a kid, basically. I grew up in the burbs in the north side of the city, and we had a commuter rail stop that led into the heart of the uh, of downtown, really. And, you know, the, the suburb I grew up in was a bit more on the conservative side in a cultural sense. And so, you know, having that train became my portal to another universe, really, as early as the age of 12. I think in some ways it kind of sealed my fate as a travel writer in a way, to be able to go through such a jarring and thrilling scene changeover so close to home in only 20 minutes basically so is that something you found yourself doing a lot is jumping the train and heading into boston as much as you could it was yes and actually i should add that i kind of did this under a false pretense at first my parents when i was uh, 12 had enrolled me in this uh, free boating program in boston that's open to lots of kids where you show up for a couple weeks and learn how to sail in the charles river they let me take the train on a company into boston for that and they assumed that i was going to the community boating program but i quickly deduced after a couple of lessons that sailing was not for me really so what i did instead was i would take whatever book I was reading and just go to Boston Common or the Public Garden and, you know, read and people watch and explore on my own. And back then, uh, this was a somewhat rougher chapter of what downtown Boston looked like. There were a lot more characters around at that time, and there was certainly a perception that the Common and the Public Garden were, you know, areas where things could get spicy at times. And so, you know, when my parents found out at the end of the summer what I'd actually been doing on those other, uh, you know, alleged community rowing visits, uh, you know, they were not too happy, but uh, it, for me, it was the beginning of a uh, long and uh, glorious relationship with Boston that has kept me rooted here to this day as my home base. Yeah, that's really cool that having the train as a possibility to get you to those spaces is amazing. We both live relatively close to New York City, so the train is something that I could always do pretty close from home. It took a while, but it was always something nice as an option, you know, as a kid or someone who isn't driving or doesn't really want to drive in the city. It's like a great way way to have that opportunity to be able to explore, kind of not necessarily have to have anything to worry about when it comes to like a typical commute into a city. You know, I'm not sure if either of you have lived in a city where there is not robust public transit or op- access to anything resembling that. But, um, you know, I spent about four years in L.A. after I turned 18. I went to college at the University of Southern California because initially I was actually interested in uh, going into film production. And while L.A. was in the process of expanding its metro system significantly when I was out there, uh, it certainly underscored the credible accessibility of so many parts of New England if you do not have a car, for instance. There is a pretty solid train network in Massachusetts. There are a lot of places that are covered in the book which are accessible by uh, not just intercity regional buses, but even local public transit authorities. And of course, there's the ferry system, which is by far the most romantic form of mass transit in the region and definitely the best way to get to Provincetown or any part of the Cape, really. So uh, that is definitely a key part of why I think I decided to uh, put down roots in this region long term, really. Uh, I've... uh, become more and more disenchanted with driving over the years, which is a funny thing to say for someone authoring a road tripping guidebook. But I think I've really started to embrace the idea of the multimodal road trip. Yeah, point. absolutely. It's uh, trains, planes, and automobiles through the Northeast. Yes, I like that. <laughs> exactly. <yes>. Yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously spending a lot of time in the city. How does that time and the time that you spend out in nature kind of differ in informing your writing? Or maybe how is it similar? Yeah, I'll, I'll, t- I'll, I'll tackle it from both ends, really. I mean, for most of my adult life, you know, um, I have always had kind of a, an internal conflict about whether I want more of my life to be rooted in the outdoors, in the backcountry, in parts of New England, or in urban environments. And I think what it comes down to is um, I have always loved the uh, 
social and cosmopolitan elements of being in a city where you have such a wide variety of people doing interesting things together, bringing their own histories to the area. And, uh, you know, usually in a city, uh, as we were saying earlier, you can uh, literally walk right into that. You know, there's a, there, it's a wonderful place for exploring in the most simple way possible. And at the same time, uh, I have always had a soft spot for the rustic, craggy majesty of places like the White Mountain National Forest or the Maine Highlands or coastline. I mean, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time in these regions growing up with my family during the summer. We actually kind of avoided the Cape for a while because there was so much traffic down there in those days. And so I really grew up, you know, chasing waterfalls in New Hampshire and uh, picking through tide pools in Maine. So just like TLC uh, wrote about. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you can't, you know, you, you can't quit that. I mean, once you've had that as a formative experience, there's always a part of you that's going to be, you know, returning to these regions. It's almost like having this kind of regular dose of seeing something that takes your breath away, something sublime, almost beyond comprehension. And I feel like that is one of the initial things that got me into the backcountry regularly to the point where when I was in college, I actually came back to New England each summer to work for the Appalachian Mountain Club in their high mountain hut system, which is covered in the book. It's a these series of uh, self-service hostels, basically, in the backcountry, where actually during the summer, there's a live-in crew that serves communal meals and hikers sleep in bunk rooms, and then often they'll hike on to the next one each day. And I was, uh, you know, a crew member up there because I'd always wondered what it would be like to actually spend a sustained amount of time living in the backcountry. And while living in a hut in New Hampshire, cooking giant terrines of black bean soup and packing supplies up and down the trail is not really a representative example of what it's truly like to live in rural New England. You know, it basically added a much deeper level to that, to the relationship I had with the backcountry to a point where I wondered in my 20s as I began writing, is it possible to merge these things in some way? And I found that this project was probably the most opportune thing I had worked on that would allow some realization of that dream, basically, through the backbone of a road trip. My writing these days, what I try to do in additional stories I write for magazines and uh, web publishers is I often try to look at activities that one typically associates with doing in a certain place, like hiking in the backcountry, and imagine, what if you could do this in Boston or Worcester or Burlington instead, highlighting really interesting urban hiking trails, for instance. Additionally, people tend to associate the uh, culinary frontier of New England with urban environments. But in fact, some of the most interesting and inventive cooking is happening uh, deep within these rural areas that we tend to associate with more recreational types of activities. You know, one of the um, towns in the northernmost part of the White Mountains, the town of Gorham, was home to one of my absolute favorite restaurants in New England for years, a place called Libby's Bistro and Salt Pub. And they had incredible owners who actually sent their cooks to Italy to apprentice uh, over there before coming with, with a friend who uh, was in, deep in the culinary scene there. And every time I would finish, you know, a long, grueling hike on Mount Madison or Adams, you know, coming out of the trail just covered with pine needles and mud, you know, I would find a way to sidle up to the bar there afterward and experience a different kind of serenity, I guess you could say. So, yeah, I feel like in New England, it's very easy to find these ways to kind of merge the environmental perks of both the urban and the rural because they're is such a packness to all these areas and uh, such surprising diversity within. I love that you mentioned urban hiking trails and just urban routes to take when in a city to see different things. We live in a world that is everything we could ever want to know is on the internet, but that is really sort of like the point of the guidebook or, or any guidebook to be like a person went through this and went through all of this and ma- and found these connections and was able to put all of them in one place. And I think I loved what you just said about how New England has all of those things together in a very compact space. And one of the spaces that you just mentioned that we both had a reaction to was White Mountains because we did... We did a New England road trip that summer. We did. We yeah. did. We went, so this was COVID summer number one, and we wanted to go hiking and get outside, but we didn't want to go too far, so we... Well, we were all in the green. That was when all the states had... <laughs> different th- and it levels. Was like and different we, levels of <laughs> like... Right. New Jersey right. was and still they were like, green. They were like, oh, New Jersey's green, Vermont's green, <laughs> yeah. New Hampshire's green. Maine is green. Maine is yeah. green. Let's, let's do this. So we went from New Jersey 
we went to Vermont. We did the Green Mountains. Then we went over to New Hampshire. We did the White Mountains. And then we went up to Maine to do Acadia for a second time. But the White Mountains were really the thing that just blew us away with yeah. us. And I just wonder how it's not a national park, how New England isn't trying to claim a second national park and wrest it away from the Forest Service because it is quite <laughs> possibly just the one of the most breathtaking spaces I've been to. I did a lot of hiking there by myself because you had you were working on a project was, at the yeah, time. Yeah, I was still working and so I had to take I just did a, a very sweeping epic hike and I just remember it it was like there was a hurricane coming so I was racing the hurricane <laughs> to nice. get to the peak <laughs> and then come back down to get back to the ho- like where we were staying but um I just I couldn't believe the space. Yeah, I'm curious, like how, obviously you had mentioned that before. So what is, you know, how do you feel about that? And and especially with me throwing out the fact that it should be a national park. (laughs) I'm with you. I mean, we're pretty much there already in practice. We have the crowds, we have the facilities, we have the absolutely epic scenery. And as you experience the epic weather systems there, because there are a bunch of fronts that converge right around the top of Mount Washington. And that's why you see all those signs that kind of warn people, you know, the most dangerous weather in the world. And Yeah, I would love to see the area codified into something like a national park. And I think that one of the challenges, uh, one of the reasons maybe that hasn't happened yet is because, you know, in New England, there is obviously a ton of regional and civic pride in many of these places here. It's why people often settle down at the same time, as I'm sure you've probably both experienced with other beautiful places you've enjoyed. There can definitely be a sense of gatekeeping quite often, too. This, This idea of like, we have to keep this kind of under the radar, because if we don't, then it'll be overrun with people. And I think that the, you know, horse is out of the barn with the White Mountains at this point. But also, you know, I've I've never really bought into that entirely myself. And one reason is because there are so many places in New England where one could quite easily fall in love with the outdoors. And one of the things that is most satisfying for me doing travel writing through projects like this one is getting to actually push back against that gatekeeping in some ways by presenting people with this curation of places, as you were describing earlier, in a way that hopefully, you know, gives them a really broad immersion in New England instead of just directing them to the same usual spots. But of course, the White Mountains, as superlative as they are, have to be in there. I mean, it's a godfather level kind of attraction here. And at this point, the activity up there is so heightened since the wake of the pandemic that one reason why I would love to see the National Park conversation come up here is because there are going to be more resources needed to really maintain those trails and deal with the uh, the capacity issues that are coming up in some places. I mean, one of the hikes that I highlight in the book, which is, you know, really one of the all-time great New England hikes, is the Franconia Ridge Loop, which uh, basically involves a nine-mile loop to three of the highest summits in the Western Presidentials, including Mount Lafayette, and you're climbing up alongside waterfalls, you're walking this little, you know, narrow ridgeline path flanked by mosses from which you can see the whole valley, and, you know, it's a it's an incredible experience, but in the last five years, the uh, parking demand for that trailhead has grown to the point where now you'll often have to park in uh, adjacent lots that are further down the highway and get shuttled up to the main trailhead. And so, you know, there are a couple of areas in the Whites that have become uh, this in demand when it comes to access. And so if a national park made it possible to basically do the trail rehab work and more to accommodate this many visitors, I'm all for it at this point. Because, you know, as much as I'd like to push back against the gatekeeping impulse, uh, overuse can be a real problem in areas that really blow up and go viral and so yeah i'm i'm not afraid of the, these kinds of changes and i think that uh if the whites could continue to become this ascendantly popular then it's going to be a necessity at some point yeah it's already a popular winter sport area because of conway being right there and mount washington is right there so there's a lot to i mean our car did not climb mount washington <laughs> no we not. thought about it no we also thought about that hike and then we were reading on it and we were like maybe not this this trip like it just seems like <laughs> it can be really dodgy and the weather can shift so yeah. fast yeah. like you said totally one thing i'll say though in addition though you know as much as the whites are a superlative and bustling destination there are a lot of pockets of the whites that are comparably epic and beautiful that for some reason 
the masses just have not embraced yet. And one of the ones that I highlight in the book is a place called Evans Notch, which is the easternmost notch in the White Mountains, actually right on the Maine-New Hampshire border. A lot of people don't realize the whites spill over into western Maine at the end right there. And there's a hike in Evans Notch called Caribou Mountain, which is about a 30% of the difficulty of Mount Washington. Comparable scenic beauty. And from the top of that peak, you can get a panoramic view of five different mountain ranges in the area, in both states. And so, you know, my hope is that, you know, and right in doing a project like this, I'm able to, you know, maybe encourage some of the traffic heading to the White Mountains to fan out a little more to some other areas. And, you know, the next time you both are up there, I highly recommend checking out one of these other notches that are highlighted there where, you know, for some reason, kind of like the canteen, the uh, the flow is just kind of uh, circled around. Them. I like that a lot. And yeah, we definitely will. That sounds like a great hike to do. Like Dusty said, we've kind of like zigzagged through New England, you know, together separately too. You know, we've been to Acadia three times at this point, both been to Provincetown. Dusty has been, you know, more than I have. I had friends that moved to Vermont, so I spent a lot of time up in the region. One of the things that I found interesting in the book that I wanted to bring up was that New York is included, New York City. And I was curious about that. Is that because it's sort of a a hub for people to kind of enter in to New England? Because when we think about New York, we think about it as like firmly mid-Atlantic. I I think of it as mid-Atlantic. I don't think of the city, which is only 40 minutes from here, as New England necessarily. So I was curious about that addition um, into the book. Yeah, so it's an unusual choice. And I think that on a primary level, the idea was kind of practical in the sense that a lot of people who come to New England for the first time are going to be coming through some port of entry adjacent to New York, especially if they're arriving from outside the region. I mean, even though Boston is very easy to fly into these days, New England could be a portion of a larger Atlantic road trip, potentially. The more we thought about it, the more it seemed that rather than just papering over New York and kind of reducing it to this gateway to New England, why not actually hire highlight it. You know, why not encourage people to spend a little bit of time roaming New York on the beginning or tail end of their trip right here? Because, you know, for a New Englander, New York is this fascinating place that you occasionally find yourself drawn back into, even if you're closely rooted to the region up here. You know, there's nothing like New York and New England. Nothing comes remotely close to it, really. It almost seems kind of strange to ignore the opportunity to go and spend a little bit of time there as a contrast to what you've encountered in New England, but maybe also as a victory note after a large you know, road trip around this region as well. And so I would agree that New York belongs to a neighboring region. And in some ways, the little chapter on New York, which is a short chapter, admittedly, feels kind of like a tribute to our neighbor in that sense, you know, as an acknowledgement of, of you are doing something that we cannot come close to competing with right here. We love it and we want to celebrate it in some way. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, uh, I enjoyed that part of it a lot. I think it also, you know, coming back to what you were saying about going into Boston as a kid, and for me, it was New York. And for the both of us, I mean, that's how we started kind of our journeying together was doing these epic hikes through New York City. And you sort of like in your exploration of Boston, I'm curious about the national park sites in Boston proper, because I've been to the Harbor Islands, which were wonderful, but I haven't done a lot of the other there's I think there's three like uh, NPS proper sites in in the city. It's the National Historic Park, the African American National Historic Site and the Harbor Islands. And New York has plenty of NPS kind of sites dotting them dotting the city. When you think about those sites, what comes to mind as far as like recommendations or you know what people should definitely do when they're in the city? For the National Historic Park, assuming that you're starting up near the water in Charlestown right there, you know, I think that it's essential to spend some time aboard the USS Constitution, the museum itself nearby has some fantastic exhibits that serve as a really enlightening window into that era of history. But it's really incredible the degree to which the ship itself has not only been preserved, but is so easily accessible to the public. I mean, one thing that's been impressed upon me going to uh, more cities uh, really since the pandemic is how many historic sites now charge some sort of entry fee or have other barriers to uh, admission. And for the ship here, it is uh, something that, you know, I have found myself just waltzing in and out of on the way back from a work visit up there some 
sometimes too. And I, and I have a feeling that, you know, part of that access, uh, you know, benefit is the fact that it is such a integral piece of Boston that people have this fondness for here. And, you know, you can really feel the echoes of history in a very visceral way when you're aboard right there. And, you know, as a bonus, the ship is also located along the Boston Harbor Walk, which is a fantastic path that basically traces the outline of the Boston Harbor coastline for almost 43 miles, actually. A lot of people don't realize it's at that scale. And if you were to follow the Harbor Walk south from the USS Constitution, that will take you into the heart of Boston, walking around the North End. And actually, it could be a pretty opportune crossover point for the Boston African American National Historic Site. Now that we're talking about walking, I mean, I think the thing that I you know really love to encourage people to try when visiting this historic site is to explore the Black Heritage Trail, which uh, you know is managed by the NPS and you know takes you through fascinating labyrinth of streets right around Beacon Hill in Boston, where you visit a lot of important historic sites that you know were especially you know tied to the abolitionist era. You know, I think it's a great example of how the concept of urban trail making, as you both were describing earlier, via this idea of curating walkable spaces in a very intentional and scenic way, has really been embraced by Boston. I mean, of course, in, in addition to the Black Heritage Trail, we have the Women's Heritage Trail, the Freedom Trail, uh, which many know about. And not to toot my own horn too much, but actually I started an urban hiking trail in Boston a couple of years ago called the Walking City Trail, which actually runs uh, 27 miles from the south edge of the city to Bunker Hill Monument through about 30 parks and green spaces. Oh, we will have to try that. (laughs) We'll have to try that next time we're in Boston. Yeah, let me know if you want any leads on it. It's it's a it's a cool experience. But, you know, the Black Heritage Trail is, you know, one of the uh, exemplars of this kind of urban recreation that Boston really has embraced to a point where I think we're starting to become recognized for that. I mean, a uh, quick tangent here, but a couple of uh, well, actually last year, um, Outside Magazine named the city of Boston as one of the top hiking destinations in the country, which was kind of astounding because they were, you know, they, they were they were not talking about the Boston area with all its woods. They were focusing on the city with routes like the Black Heritage Trail. And so it's become one of our civic calling cards. Now, you know, from there, if you were to go back toward the water, of course, then you have the Boston Harbor Islands at this point. The Harbor Islands are one of the ecological gems of the city that can be a little bit trickier to visit sometimes because there is a ferry that, you know, runs service to a number of them during the summer, a more limited number during the off seasons. The ferry prices are a little higher than most of us would like them to be. There's actually some movement to try to get those lowered for better access to the islands. But if you're visiting Boston, it is more than worth the I would not call it a splurge but you know it's 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 worth it to take the ride and clomp around the old forts and catacombs at George's Island which is one of the most frequently visited ones home to a lot of old civil war era infrastructure with many tunnels and hiding nooks to explore another favorite of mine is Heddock's Island which is a much more rustic and forested one where you also have some old fort ruins but they really feel swallowed by the greenery in a way that kind of brings to mind lost and then of course course, there's Spectacle Island, which is one of the harbor islands that's most commonly used for special events like yoga classes or, uh, you know, big dinners that a group might be having. And it's pretty, it's mostly free of trees for the most part. So you definitely don't want to go there on a broiling day when all Boston is being baked by the sun. But in the evening, you know, standing up there on this kind of exposed hill, looking over the waters and gazing back at the city aglow is a pretty magical experience. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I know at least one of them. I think it's the one I visited, but this was a long time ago, was once the like the trash heap for Boston that has been since rehabbed into an actual island. Am I wrong about that? I'm going to look this up myself after the fact, but I be- I am 90% sure that that's Spectacle Island we're okay. talking about. I think that's probably then the island that I went to. Yeah. And it was a broiling day. <laughs> yes, and I think, and that's partially why there's not much of a, uh, you know, real tree canopy there or anything, because it, you know, it is essentially, you know, a, uh, yeah, for a former dump that has been kind of, you know, paved over with dirt and turned into something. Much yeah, repurposed. Point, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we've done a marathon walk through New York. We've done one through Philadelphia and we've, we kind of like. Kind of did it in D.C. as well. We did kind of do it in D.C. We, we haven't done Boston yet. So you've just given us plenty of trail options 
yeah. through the city now <laughs> to get that marathon. Wait, what? Is, so, in. so what does a marathon walk involve for you both? How do you plan? Oh, that? <laughs> well, okay. So this was something that like totally organically started between the two of us. Like it's always been kind of like part of just culture of our friendship is is the fact that we get on foot and we walk everywhere. And so it was just like uh, a really I nice know, spring 12 day. 12 years ago, yeah. really nice spring day. And I called Mike and was like, hey, it's gorgeous and it's, you know, warm out. Do you want to like go to the city and just walk? And he was like, oh yeah, let's go. So we like, we drove in, we parked and we walked all around and then we ended up in Riverside and then we're just like walking down Riverside and we were like, wouldn't it be great if we ended up like in Battery Park and then we just kept walking all the way to Battery Park and then we got dinner and then like we went back and we walked all the way from the cloisters to Battery Park then we went back again and we were like well we had almost walked a marathon let's actually plan a marathon so we planned like from the bottom of Central Park all the way through like the top end we had to go around Central Park twice had to go around Central Park a couple of times and then we got up to the cloisters and then all the way down to Battery Park again. And so like that sort of just laid the foundation of sort of us walking to us hiking together. And then we did it in Philly. We've done it in D.C. And then we just transitioned that into national parks. So when you were like, oh, there's a 27 mile trail, yeah. this walking. <laughs> ding, ding, and ding. It was like, <laughs> yeah. oh, we got to mark that yeah, down. Yeah, through. Yeah, we gotta absolutely. Mark that down. You know, no, absolutely. we love that. What a great tradition. I mean, actually, exactly what you both describe reminds me of an experience I had with one of my best friends here in Boston a while ago that, you know, cemented this city as a place where I really want to live a substantial part of my life. And also, you know, just highlighted how beautiful walking could be. Um, He was, uh, this is a friend of mine named George Heinrichs, who I worked with in the Appalachian Mountain Club hut system years ago. He was visiting me when I had first moved to Boston after college. I was living in uh, Cambridge at the time, kind of near Harvard Square. And we went out to a place called Bukowski Tavern, which is actually in the book and now located in Back Bay in Boston. But we had this incredible server named Mallory who just put us under a spell where anything she suggested we order, we went for it right there. And, you know, after... I don't even know how many drinks and, you know, a plate of deep fried Oreos we, you know, trudged home at that point, had the most wretched morning imaginable the next day and realized that, you know, we just had to walk. We had to, st- it was kind of this, you know, primal impulse of like, well, look, this is going to be a, a, this is going to be a really rough morning, but like, let's walk and see how that feels. And, you know, we ended up kind of accidentally going 20 miles through the city, eventually ending up on the Emerald Necklace, which is also covered in the book. It's a beautiful linear park system in Boston that really drapes around the city, kind of like a necklace and as we were approaching the main uh, hill at Arnold Arboretum this gorgeous tree sanctuary in Jamaica Plain we saw these two familiar people sitting up on a hill and it was my parents who just happened to be there having this picnic they saw us and it was kind of this uh, you know moment when everything came together and it kind (laughs) of Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that that's that's possible. Something a version of that is possible anywhere, but the uh, environmental conditions are really ripe for it in New England. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Last summer went to the Pacific Northwest I mean, if my first time, Mike had hiked there before, but we did Olympic, we did Mount Rainier, and then we were like, Okay, great and we booked ourselves a couple of days in Seattle to relax. We were like, Well, we wanna see Seattle. And we're going to do it the way we usually do it, which is on foot on foot. So we ended up like hiking or walking 10 to 12 miles each of our each of the days we were there. Each of our off days, (laughs) we did like 12 miles a day. I mean, it was like, but that's that's our favorite thing. Yeah. But it brings me to like this point about New England in particular is that. We talk all the time about like how there are so many ways to engage in with national parks. Like some people are get out on foot, hike people. Some people are backcountry people. Some people are get in the car, drive there and just look from the car. That's all I can do. Some people have kids and so they want to get out a little bit, maybe like walk out to a viewpoint, maybe take in a visitor center and then sort of, you know, return to wherever they're staying. But something that New England, I feel like, has always offered, at least to us, and I feel like offers generally, is just so many delicious on-foot experiences. Obviously, there's so much hiking. There's so much city. It's such walkable city. But there's also so many, like, wonderful places like Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. I've been to Martha's Vineyard a couple times, but the last time uh, we were able to go together, and it's like... 
It was so nice to be able to like get out of the car, take a ferry and then be on foot for the rest of the day. As we were saying, like do things other than just driving. And I think New England in particular offers so many delicious opportunities like that in so many different kinds of spaces for on foot experiences. Absolutely. I mean, it's actually great that you hit on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket because these are some of the only places I've been to in the U.S. where you are very much encouraged to leave your car behind. I mean, there's a real culture of doing that, of using bikes and, and you know, your own feet to get around because obviously it's uh, much easier, you know, and less logistically complicated, as you both alluded to earlier, but also it just allows you to take in these places at a much more savoring kind of speed. Werner Herzog is one of my idols, basically, once said, you know, the world reveals reveals itself to those who travel on foot. And I do think uh, in the last five years alone, I've had a lot of experiences in New England, which have affirmed that. I mean, one other place where you can do that that is a much more recent example of, uh, you know, intentional foot travel is in the Berkshires. The local Natural Resources Council is in the process of creating a pathway that's going to run from south to north across the spine of those mountains, uh, going through all the major towns along the route. But this is not going to be a grueling New England style hiking path with rocks, roots, and steep climbs or anything. The idea here is to create a much more gently graded, spacious path where people can really walk and let their minds wander in a more meditative way. And it's called the High Road. And the first segment between Pittsfield and Lenox opened a couple of years ago. The next one is in the works. Uh, I've walked it twice now, once myself during summer and once during foliage season with my dad. I think it illustrates exactly what you both are saying, especially the fact that it's really a, a delicious walking experience. When whether you're talking about the, the actual edible places that a route like that can take you or just the scenic qualities that you can better savor going at that speed, it's something that I think is kind of a common denominator for much of New England, really. I feel like in any of the six states now, I know where I can go to reliably leave the wheels behind for a little while and reacquaint myself with the world in that way. As someone who is constantly curious about the birds in my neighborhood, from those on the branches to those in the air, I often have trouble identifying what I'm hearing or what I'm seeing because they may be moving too fast for me to get a good view of. Feather Snap takes the often tricky art of bird identification and makes it so much simpler through its top of the line camera and incredible AI programming. After setting up my Feather Snap bird feeder in my yard, I couldn't believe the birds I was seeing and capturing in photos and videos. If anything, the excitement of having a bird appear at the feeder and then be captured by the camera only stoked my excitement for what other birds might appear and what birds I should be on the lookout for while I was out and about. If you're looking to up your bird watching game or want to get your friends and family engaged in and excited about the birds in your area, then Feather Snap is for you. From its solar powered top of the line camera in its unique dual bin feeder to its incredible mobile app which collects photos and videos at the feeder. Feather Snap is a complete game changer. Check them out today at feathersnapcam.com. That's feathersnapcam.com. Hey y'all, it's Dusty and Mike with exciting news. That's right, it's our episode finder. It's all about making finding our episodes even easier. Want to find more episodes about hikes in Shenandoah with over 10 episodes across two separate seasons? It would have involved a lot of scrolling and searching. Now with our episode finder, you can find all those episodes with a few easy clicks. That way, finding an episode on Yosemite from season one is just as easy as finding an episode on Zion, Yellowstone, and Haleakala, all in separate seasons. With over 275 episodes, in 35 different national parks, our episode finder will add ease when finding out more about hikes in these spaces. But it's not just about hikes by national park. We've categorized our entire library so you can find hikes by state, hikes by terrain, and hikes by difficulty. And all of our trail mix episodes are there too, so you can easily find our science-based episodes, interviews, and more. Planning a trip to Colorado and want to hear more about our adventures there? Want to grunt it out on some really tricky trails or learn more about glaciers, grasslands, and mountains? Just click the link in our show notes or on our Instagram bio and it pops right up. You can also head directly to our website and look for the episode finder at the top of the navigation bar. Conquer one hike in one national park, one park at a time with just a few clicks with our episode finder. Happy trails! 
The Berkshires is definitely something that neither of us have done. So it's it's definitely a section of the book that piqued our interest for sure. Oh, yeah. I talk about the Berkshires all the time because my my background is theater. I'm also a theater artist, so I'm a director, actor, playwright as well. There's so much professional theater in the Berkshires. So there's a thank you so much for mentioning it in the book because actors from New York go to the Berkshires to work all the time, all the time. It's not only a place of like beautiful, natural splendor, like you can also like take in really good theater too. It's actually a really interesting thing that you see in the Berkshires and also parts of Vermont. The idea that for many folks in New York who may be involved in the theater scene, the film scene, or other parts of the uh, artistic ecosphere, this is one of the closest places where you can go to have an out-of-mind experience in a wildly different environment that, you know, may bring a certain inspiration of its own. And I mean, one of the places that, you know, really uh, highlights that for many visitors in the Berkshires is the old home of Herb and Melville, of course. I mean, he made his uh, real homestead in um, you know the hills near Pittsfield and he would look out from his study at this mountain ridge in the, to the north that people sort of think resembles a whale he was writing Moby Dick when he lived there and I think I think that the interpretation that the ridge was the whale is somewhat generous upon looking at it myself but it does speak to this idea that you know for those of us who are used to the cacophony of urban environments uh, a dramatic change of scene can really get these neurons firing in a creative way I mean actually when I myself have to tackle a really big writing project in a short period of time, maybe it's writing a book proposal or a chapter, I will almost always go to either the main highlands or the Berkshires or the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, which is also in the book as a way of, uh, you know, tackling that. I've, I've found it to be the closest thing I have to a proven technique, really. But I love that about the Berkshires. And, you know, I, I do think that one thing is, that's kind of neat about them is so much of the theater crowd, the art crowd, the music crowd that you find in the Berkshires is coming from New York. And I think that that is because for people in greater Boston, the White Mountains and the Maine coast are kind of perceived as the closest places where you can go and have an equivalent experience if you were coming from a creative field. And so, you know, the Berkshires are not far from Boston by any stretch. But speak again, speaking to the scale of New England, you know, even just an hour of difference in driving time can feel like a thousand miles for people coming from Boston because it can be a provincial place sometimes. And so when I go to the Berkshires, you know, even though I am well within my own state, I really feel a sense of distance like I have stepped into a region that is less familiar to me and deeply intriguing we would be absolutely remiss and I'm shocked I'm not shocked but I'm like I love that we've spoken now for 40 minutes and um, we've yet to talk about Acadia which is could be our favorite place one of our favorite places in the world it's like like a home park it's like our home park even though shenandoah is much closer acadia Um, is just like the space (laughs) for us yeah there's well i mean like acadia is where we decided to like incepted the show in yes incepted the show it started there yeah we very quickly um we were doing the Bar Island hike, we were like, okay, yeah, we should have a joint Instagram for all of our photos. But, oh, we have to pick a name. What do we call it? And then very quickly the name came out. He was like, gaze at the National Parks. I was like, yeah, and it would be really great if we spelled it G-A-Z-E. And that was the end. That was that fast. And that's how it came about. And then shortly thereafter, the podcast began. It is... One of our favorite places, it's one of these parks where we've now been three times. Every time we go, it's like we're going for the first time because we, like we went with um, friends last time, the third time we went, they'd never been before. And we were like, oh. We've seen it all. We've We've seen seen it it all. all. (laughs) And and we ended up, everything we did with them, we had never done before. We were like, well, you know, stand corrected. Acadia gives you something new every time. Yeah, absolutely. And so- um, we were like in South Harbor, which we had never gone down to before. We had done a lot of like hikes in that area because we had done the West Side. We had done Scudic Peninsula, which we absolutely love, love with. Scudic Peninsula. And we had done the, you know, the East Side of the park. We haven't been out to Isle of Haute. Isle of Haute. Yeah, Isle of Haute. Um, that's like the one 
like kind of big area that we haven't done yeah, yet. Have, but, but next time, me but too. Time. Actually, this okay. this coming this coming year, I'm hoping to finally notch that off. I, yeah. As I understand, for a while, the only way you could get there was by you know jumping on the mailboat whenever it left the main. I think so that's I'm not what sure if that's changed. Hillary I think said. That's what yeah. Hillary said. Yeah. Um, because we interviewed we interviewed Hillary, who writes the the Acadia book. Also, Hillary was like. Okay, now we're going to this spot to listen to live music and get popovers. And we were like, we would have never known. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this this yeah. is such a yeah. cool thing to <laughs> it do. It was also our first tide pool experience in the three times that uh, we had been. Oh, um, seriously. Talk yeah. about wow. tide pools. So, love them. It was really great to be able to go out to that ship's harbor. Shipwreck harbor. Yeah, shipwreck Ship, harbor. Shipwreck oh, that's, harbor. That's. One of the most, one of my favorite places to see at dusk anywhere in New England when the fog is rolling in, you have that kind of purplish light. Yeah, it's so beautiful. It was incredible. Oh, yeah. Um, Oh, yeah. It's like Acadia gives you like every mood you could ever want, like through the nature. (laughs) It's true. Like when we did Scudic Peninsula, I mean, I like part of me is like, I never want to hike it again because the it was special. It was so (laughs) wonderful the one time we did it. Yeah. But of course we'll hike it again because it was just that was the first time I've ever felt like actual soft earth under my feet and like just moss everywhere. And then we got to the end, we get to the shore and it's just gray fog foggy and yeah. i was like we're staying here <laughs> for an hour and he was like no we're not we're moving on <laughs> so, but i'm curious if somebody were visiting acadia for the first time what are the things that you would say like definitely don't miss these things so before i get into it, one thing i would preface this by saying is that if the person who's visiting acadia has the option to go there at the tail or beginning of the, of the main peak season which is kind of like late june through mid-september it is so worth it to check that place out in the off season right there because the way in which the traffic absolutely nosedives at either end of it right there really opens up the park to you in such a profound way. Especially, I think that window of late September through mid-October, it might be my all-time favorite window for visiting the area. I actually went up there for the first time to do that when I was running a half marathon that they have on Mount Desert Island, usually in October. And I was so disappointed that I couldn't stay longer and, you know, hike the trails. I couldn't because I was absolutely aching from the race, but I made a mental note to come back during the same window the next year. And so I imagine that's a lot of hills, a lot of hills. Yes. <laughs> yes. The, uh, <laughs> but there's a, there's a giant pot of lobster stew at the end of it, a lot of local beer. So it all about, ba- it it's a wash in the end. You know, thinking about that first trip though, I mean, I'm hearkening back to my own first experience with Acadia, which actually did not happen until I was 28. You know, even though we spent a lot of time on the main coast, we became kind of habitual with the two to three places we would go to every year, which were much more in the uh, Casco Bay area near Portland. The first time I went to Acadia, I only had about 48 hours there with a friend. The first thing that we did, and I actually think this is a great inaugural Acadia hike, is we started doing the Jordan Pond Trail, which encircles Jordan Pond in the center of the island, one of the most heavenly bodies of water anywhere in New England. Uh, You know, you start right from the Jordan Pond house itself, which is renowned for its popovers. Very popular. You will need reservations to get them these days. But, you know, to be able to enjoy them out there on the terrace, looking across the pond at the mountains nearby, it's definitely worth it. Now, those mountains that you are looking toward from... The south end of Jordan Pond are known as North and South Bubble Mountains due to their bubble-like shape. And, uh, you know, if you are looking for a slightly more rigorous kind of hike in Acadia, you know, beyond the beautiful uh, lulling kind of path around the pond, the bubbles are a great first taste because not only do, do they involve a fair amount of the classic New England rock stairs taking you up to the top, but the trail up to South Bubble actually involves a little bit of iron ladder run climbing in one place. And this is, kind, as you both probably know, this is definitely a sign of things that could come later on in your Acadia journey because, uh, you know, one of the things that absolutely blew my mind about this place when I went there was the artistry and how the trails are constructed, the carving of the stones and the placement of them, the way the places in which they're able to put staircases where you'd think staircases couldn't exist. But, you know, the iron ladders and iron ladder rungs affixed to the cliffs are like nothing else in New England. There are a couple other parts of places in inland Maine where you'll occasionally find them. But the fact that the Acadia trail builders embrace these elements as, you know, additional adventure options so heartily really makes Acadia feel kind of like the Disneyland of trails to me sometimes, especially when you take into account just the collage of all the you know, inland and oceanic elements. And so 
I think that that first hike, you know, around Jordan Pond, possibly over the bubbles, great place to start. If you, you know, decide you want to keep things on kind of the gentler side, another place that I would absolutely check out is the Ocean Path, which runs along the uh, around the park road on the east side right there. Again, it will be quite busy in the summer, but the Ocean Path is a great way to leave the cacophony of the road behind and, you know, find and, and to really get deep into these cliffside forest environments right in the coast there where you really feel like you were at the edge of New England, if not the earth at that point. You know, the, the, the look back at nearby Sand Beach, which is a great place to swim right at the start of the ocean path, is uh, one of the more romantic things you can gaze at in New England. And, uh, you know, if you get all the way to the end, you'll see people doing rock climbing on some cliffs near uh, Otter Point. Now, if you find yourself craving something more adventurous, if you, you know, if that first hike around Jordan Pond and the bubbles kind of, you know, has you in a, yeah, bring it on kind of mode, there are two places I would uh, highlight here. The first is one of the most famous hikes in Acadia, a mountain known as the Beehive, which is a small mountain, you know, with a fairly exposed summit. Oh, you, you two are nodding with uh, recognition. Oh, see. yeah, we're very The first familiar. time we did it, we went backwards. Because we, yeah, we, we approached it a, from, and we, everyone was very generous with us yeah. as they were coming up. Wow. And it was not the best, but it wasn't the worst. Either. Well, yeah. I'm so, I'm so I, glad have, generous. I have a fear of heights but I deal with it when it comes to hiking. Because I make him. Right. And um, <laughs> we got to, I was like, oh, right. We're following the map. We're like, oh, yeah, there's there's not much left of this trip. And then it was like straight down with the ladder. And I was like, <laughs> oh, oh no. God. And it was like, a, I strapped in and was like, well, okay, we're in this now. Oh, geez. My, my, I, I can only imagine. I mean, the thing I was, is the Beehive, uh, for those who've never heard, is a, uh, the Beehive Trail, I should say, is basically a sequence of ladder rungs and ledges that you pretty much have to monkey your way up with a uh, sense of uh, muted self-preservation, I would say. I will, I will add that the trail is very thoughtfully laid out. You know, it took me right to the edge of my comfort zone climbing it. There are trails on Acadia that are even more extreme in this way, which I am, which I am too scared to try. But the beehive is kind of a great flirtation with that element of danger. And as you climb these ledges and ladders, you get incredible views of Sands Beach below the eastern waters of the island. And, uh, you know, I have also found that people tend to be really cool about sharing the trail when I go up that way, too, which is which is great. That not always something you can count on in these places. One pro tip I will add that I kind of learned the hard way is that during the summer, any trail with ladder rungs, it might be a good idea to bring some gloves with you because the ladder rungs can get quite slippery due to people with sunscreeny hands using them throughout the day. And so I definitely wish that I had that in my arsenal the first time I did the beehive and I've used them for subsequent hikes but on the iron run route if you do want something a little more off the beaten path another fun option which actually I think is more intense than the beehive is the Jordan Cliff Trail which is on the west side of Jordan Pond kind of near the beehives it's ultimately a climb to the top of Penobscot Mountain which is this incredible broad exposed summit from which you can look over uh, Somme Sound to the west of there and the Jordan Cliff Trail as the name implies gets to the summit via the these incredible cliffs overlooking the pond where there are not only ladder rungs, but there are these balance beam like bridges that feel like something out of American Ninja Warrior. And there are also peregrine falcons that nest up there in the summer. So, uh, you know, you probably won't see them because they tend to close the trail during the nesting season. But if you're there, you know, August or September, you never know. So on the hiking front, those are some of my all time favorites. When it comes to nourishment, recovering, uh, you know, of course, Bar Harbor is often considered the, uh, you know, culinary hub of the island, which it probably is in an empirical way. I mean, the heft and the richness of Mount Desert Island ice cream, you know, the, the flagship uh, cone stand up there is really unparalleled. It's some of the most inventive and rich ice cream I've ever had in my life. We're but very familiar. Oh, good. They have, oh, yeah. uh, they have a few offshoots in other cities now, including uh, even Washington, D.C., I think. But as you two were saying earlier, I have really found myself going to the south side of the island, to Southwest Harbor more often, not just because it's quieter, but because you know there has really been a wonderful speckling of food options down there as well. I mean, one of my actually favorite places on all of, of Acadia for breakfast is the Common Good Kitchen, which is a food pantry and soup kitchen based right there that does the most amazing popovers I've had before. That's, That's where, where we, we went, went the popovers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was where we yeah. were. Incredible. Yeah, 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 we didn't know about it, and it was amazing. And you probably discovered this, too, but they have the most incredible homemade butters, too. Maple, walnut, all these other flavors. So, yes, you know, did. it's very much a place to live deliciously. And you know? we had, um, um, and there was like a live band when we 
stopped in and it was so much fun. We just sat and listened to music and ate popovers and ate all those butters. Oh, they were wonderful. All of them. Bar Harbor, I mean, we could call it like the cutest town in America. I mean, it is the most wonderful little place with so much. And like, what I love about that place is like, you can be like standing there getting ice cream. And then in five minutes, you can be on a trail in Acadia heading up a mountain. It's so true. I mean, actually, a buddy of mine who lives up there for much of the year has basically been devising a way to try to hike all across the island via a constellation of the trails that are on Acadia. And you can actually do that because there's so many of them that run right into these places, population centers. And so it's great. You know, one thing I'll add about Bar Harbor, I mean, not, you know, it, it is an, inc- an an adorable place. And, you know, it's set, there's such a attractive heft of, you know, people and things happening there at all times. And if there's anywhere on Acadia where I would really recommend, you know, try trying to leave the car behind, you know, maybe utilizing the Island Explorer shuttle system, which is such a great resource. Uh, You know, it's Bar Harbor in the evening. It is so packed with people that driving through that area can be kind of a nightmare and an anxiety trip. But, uh, you know, if you can walk to the green, catch a concert, look out at the water, it's just magic. That is a great point. The last time we were at, in Acadia, we spending time in the south side, we did the Flying Man Trail, which was new to us, which is... Oh. That trail, like leading to that like cove, was yeah, it was really incredible, unbelievable. Yeah. Are so you've done the Flying Man Trail? I have, and just because you mentioned it, I mean, yeah, that was actually when I was I was up there uh, on my own the other year, and my parents came up to visit briefly, and I took them on that same trail as well, and they were totally enchanted by it. And you know, that was the end of the hike that, uh, on that occasion. But I came back a couple of days later and found that if you continue hiking north from the harbor on this other path called the Valley Cove Trail which basically takes you really high up to these cliffs overlooking the cove via these incredibly steep rock staircases that you know look like they could give way at any minute. It actually leads you to one of the only freestanding waterfalls in all of Acadia too, this little cascade called Manowar Cove Falls, which is literally a brook that is kind of exploding out of the forest right there as it hits the cliffs and spilling down into the ocean. And so... Yeah, I mean, that's it just illustrates how, you know, when you discover a gem in Acadia, you know, it always feels like you're always confronted with like five additional pathways from which you could go and step into something more. It's just, yeah, it's an absurd abundance of riches in that little island. And we will have to do that the next time we're there. It is definitely the word that comes to mind for that national park is charming. Um, I feel like an more than and, and I enchanting liked that. more than any any park I can kind of think of. And the fall is definitely a time that we need to get up because we've done spring and summer, but we haven't been up in the fall. And speaking of the fall, I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk leaf peeping <laughs> because I feel yeah. like that is <laughs> such a such a fall activity. I'm sure that New England explodes at that time in regards to that. So I guess the optimal time to go, I'm assuming, shifts year to year depending on the climate, and especially now our climate is so all over the place. But what should you expect or kind of go in knowing before you're potentially taking a trip to New England to leaf peep? And are there areas that perhaps are better than others? Boy, so I think that the place to begin here is, you know, in New England leaf peeping season, you tend to have the advantage of having most of the traffic for leaf peeping concentrated on just a couple of areas, really. Um, the Kankamagus Highway in the White Mountains is going to be maybe at the top of the pile. That is a, uh, you know, beautiful exposed highway that basically runs between uh, the Pemajuasa Wilderness and the Sandwich Range. Tons of mountain views, and so naturally it is... Uh, basically a parking lot during uh, early October. The level of traffic that you experience on the Kank is, uh, can be quite nightmarish at times, to the point where a lot of us who live here have actually abandoned that as one of our go-to spots for foliage seeking. I mean, if you can go on a weekday, it's going to be marginally better for sure. But on a weekend, the level of activity there, and also on Vermont's Route 100, the uh, scenic byway that goes from south to north throughout the state, the level of traffic might necessitate finding an alternative spot on the weekends, particularly because if you set your sights in one of these two areas for uh, a weekend fall foliage excursion, you are going to find that hotels in the area are either full or astronomically expensive too. But, you know, that the thing that's kind of um, surprising about the concentration of activity here is that there are so many great places to leave peep within, within New England, often within an hour of these two areas as well. I mean, let's say that you want to check out Vermont, for instance. The place where I would recommend, you know, really... Uh, 
uh, spending most of your time is a region called the Northeast Kingdom, which is pretty much the northeast corner of the state up there. This uh, beautiful expanse of green hills, uh, you know, forests that are both boreal and deciduous. You do get lots of leaves up there turning at that time. And this tends to be a bit earlier because it's rather far north. For that, for peak foliage up there, you're probably going to want to look at late September, early October for a trip. And the Northeast Kingdom is home to some of the most incredible food and drink in Vermont as well. I mean, Hill Farmstead Brewery, which is one of the most acclaimed breweries in the world, really renowned for their pale ales. The fall might be one of the most gorgeous seasons to go and enjoy a couple of beers on their porch overlooking the valley nearby. One thing that Vermont is kind of underrated for is the quality of its pizza, too. I've never had bad pizza in Vermont all the time I've been there. And, uh, you know, there are many places where you can, you know, just order a big pie and, you know, really savor the magic hour of the day up there after a long day of driving around these mostly dirt roads and, uh, you know, taking in all the uh, greenery, or I should say the autumnal greenery. Now, suppose you wanted to set your sights on the White Mountains instead, but you wanted to avoid the madness of the Kankamagas. Uh, Evans Notch, which I mentioned earlier, kind of on the main New Hampshire border, is a great alternative to go, where you are pretty much dri- you're pretty much driving through these halls of trees that occasionally open up to give you this view of the nearby mountains in a really beautiful way. I'm kind of stunned by how few people have discovered Evans Notch after all these uh, you know years of ascendant hiking in the region, uh, especially after the pandemic. But it is still very much like a hidden valley. It kind of I mean the first time I went through it, I you know I had breakfast in North Conway, which is you know one of the most busy towns in the White Mountains, about a you know probably half hour away from the start of uh, Evans Notch in the south end. I had dinner in Gorham, New Hampshire, at the north end of the Whites, after popping up through the other side of the Notch, and I just felt like I had been through the Hollow Earth or something. You know, it just had a real you know lost world quality to it. One other one that is also great in the Whites in general is the uh, section of Route 302 that goes through Crawford Notch, which is kind of the central most notch in the White Mountains. Uh, you know, you'll have a little bit more visitor traffic there, but compared to the Kankamagas, it's a much more palatable alternative during peak season. And as you descend through the notch, if you are going in an easterly direction toward North Conway, you get one of the most awe-inspiring views of the presidentials opening up to form this great wooded valley that you're driving down into on a pretty steep road. Then you pass these enormous cascades on the left, and you're just like, this is ridiculous at a certain point, you know? I mean, it's like almost too much White Mountains. But yeah, those are um, some of the places that I would really uh, underscore when it comes to, you know, opportune foliage gazing territory that has not been discovered and swamped at this point. But really, I mean, you know, there there are some, I mean, given that so much of New England is covered with deciduous trees and is drivable and walkable and boatable, there are so many places where you can have a seminal foliage experience. I mean, actually, you know, you can have it without a car if you want to. You can take a, a boat cruise along mid-coast Maine and, you know, gaze at the leaves from that perspective. You can, you uh, Go on a canopy tour in, uh, you know, in the Connecticut coast, uh, you know, go, literally going through the fall canopy at that point on a zip line. There's a couple of uh, places in Vermont where you can experience that, too. And I mean, one other option is, uh, oh, yeah, well, you know, one other thing you can do is just take the Amtrak Vermonter and you can you can actually leaf peep from the train as it kind of burrows through the woods going north towards St. Albans. Uh you know, you could that that could be you know part of the backbone for another journey in New England with some bonus leaf peeping thrown in right there if you happen to go on the train route in uh, you know early October. So yeah, I think that uh, you know as much as people tend to kind of mythologize uh, foliage spectating in New England, it's actually something that is very easy to just kind of stumble into regardless of where you are in the state right here. You can make a much more epic plan to trip out of it to a certain region, but you know as long as you are near you know, some level of deciduous forestry here during that late September, early October window, you know, it's kind of happening all around you. You can leaf peep from, you know, very, you know, pedestrian locations quite often. And I love that about the region. Thank you, because that gives so much context for so many people, because that is such a iconic New England thing to do. Well, first of all, thank you. This has been amazing. And your depth of knowledge is... <laughs> It's quite literally astounding to hear all of what it, what you have, like, and are able to, like, basically just talk very succinctly off the cuff on is incredible, especially when it comes to this region. And it's very clear that you have a lot of love and you've spent a lot of time here. I think one final question I have is, if someone was to pick up your book, what do you want them to to kind of take away from your book or from an experience within New England? 
I think something that I would love for people to take away from Mood New England road trip is that we often hear about New England, uh, you know, as a list of, you know, certain regions and experiences, really, that are kind of presented in a rather siloed fashion, very a la carte. And, you know, one of my favorite things about living in New England and traveling through here is exactly what, you know, something that you both were talking about earlier, which is the hidden connections between so many of these spaces, not just geographic connections, but you know, natural recreational crossover effects, cultural connections, you know, the fact that, as we were talking about earlier, you have these thriving artistic scenes that are based not only in cities, but in these select pockets of the backcountry up here, too. And I, I love that about the region. And I really hope that Moon New England Road Trip can basically illustrate that for people by, you know, showing them these curated, suggested ways to experience the New England region that I think, you know, illustrate just how proximal so many of the most beautiful elements of the region actually are. I mean, it's really the the thing that keeps many of us happily rooted here long term. And and uh, I do think road tripping can be a really wonderful way of discovering that in any region. And in New England, it just feels very naturally occurring. Looking for more episodes like the one you just heard? Then be sure to check out our episode finder for episodes by park, state, hiking difficulty, and terrain, as well as all of our trail mix episodes in one helpful place. Click the link in the show notes of this episode, our Instagram bio, or visit our website to make your listening experience even easier. This has been Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast, and we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often, and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created, produced, edited, and hosted by us, Dustin. Justin Ballard and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at Gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at Gaze at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on this show, visit our website, Gaze at the National Parks.com. That's Gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on Instagram and on our website is by me, Michael Ryan. All original music was written and performed by Dave Seaman and Mariella Klinger with Sean Sclios on guitar. Our music producer is Skylar Ford Gang. We would also like to acknowledge that while recording this episode that we were on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as New Jersey. 